This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world-class software like PDF Pen for Mac, PDF Pen Pro for Mac, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander for Mac, and Text Expander for iPhone and iPad. Learn more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. And by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, one of the hottest things out there going right now are the new MacBook Pros with the touch bar. But what if you don't have a, Mac, a MacBook Pro or not going to get a new MacBook Pro, but you'd still like to experience? We have a developer with us today who can solve that problem for you. Mr. J Daniel Jalkut is here from Red Sweater Software to talk about Touche. Daniel, it's Touche. Touche. Yes. I, 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 this is not a fencing it's fun podcast. To say. Yeah. It's fun to say. Yeah. Thank you for being here. It's great to talk to you. Oh, thanks for having me. So, so I, I, I kind of, I guess, stole the thunder, but explain what Touche is and how it works and uh, all that. So the day that um, Apple announced the uh, the Touch Bar and the new MacBook Pros, they were kind enough to give Apple developers through the Xcode software a uh, sort of bundled with Xcode simulator where it opens up a little window, um, lets you see exactly what the Touch Bar would look like if you happen to have the new MacBook Pro already. And um, I thought this was really cool, very very nice of Apple to give us this stuff as developers. Um, but I immediately started getting annoyed with having to go to this Xcode menu to activate it and deactivate it. Um, and I wondered, I started to get curious about how it worked internally and hacking around at it a little bit. Uh, I learned that I should be able to put together my own app that creates the same kind of window on the Mac to essentially give the same simulated touch bar um, as what comes with Xcode, but you don't need Xcode. And um, as I put that together, I was kind of excited. It seemed to work. I realized, oh, this is going to be kind of nice for me, nice for other developers who want to be able to quickly toggle it on and off, for instance, with a keyboard shortcut. But um, also for designers or just people who um, want to play around with it in advance of you know, actually forking out the cash for the, the new MacBook Pro. And um, so it started to come together, and I realized... Um, it felt like something that was, I could either put it on GitHub or something like that, you know, as a series of hacks for other developers to compile and build on their own. Or I could, you know, I think once I really got the idea that a lot of quote unquote everyday users would be excited to check this out, I thought I can't just put this on GitHub. I can't just, um, make this, uh, you know, a hack that somebody downloads with and, and, and creates with Xcode on their own. Um, I wanted to make it like the most, you know, user-friendly, easy to download and run thing that I possibly could. And so I think I pretty much achieved that. There's one um, one major gotcha, which I'm sure you probably noticed, is um, you need to get this special version of Mac OS 10.12.1. Uh, Apple, in the process of doing this, they ended up releasing two versions of 10.12.1. So this has been uh, a really, it's, I've been satisfied that the customer support has been almost none, thankfully, but that customer support, which I already encountered in the first day, has almost entirely been confusion about which version of Mac OS to install. So how do I know if I have the correct <coughs> version of Mac OS 10 point, I'm sorry, 2.1? 10.12.1. Sorry, 10.12.1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I know which one I have? And if I don't have the right one, how do I get it? So I made this really easy for if you if you do go to download the app, because if you download the app and you launch it um, and you're on 10.12, first of all, you have to be on 10.12.1. If you think you're on 10.12.1 and you go to download it and you launch it, you may very well be on 10.12.1, but if you're on the quote unquote wrong one, it will actually, the app will tell you and it will... Um, it will give you a link, more info, click that button, and then on that page, on my site, it actually has a link to the Apple official page for how to get the new newest version of 10.12.1. So it is the newest version? Yes. As At least as of this recording? Yeah, as far as I can tell, what they did was they came out with 10.12.1, and then 
a couple days later, they um, they released a minor, minor update that basically just includes the toolbar, the touch bar support. So I think it's kind of 10.12.1, and then whoops, we got to put that touch bar stuff in, but we don't want to go all the way to 10.12.2 yet. So that's my impression of what Apple was thinking. Okay. So is this, um, I, I don't want to insult you, <laughs> is, <laughs> is, this a, is this a hack or is it something that you would expect should continue to work moving forward for those of us who are not ready or haven't gotten our, our MacBooks uh, with the touch bar yet? Yeah, first of, all, so first of all, I'm not insulted by any insinuation <laughs> that it is a hack because it uh, most certainly is a hack. And um, actually, you know, um, one of the nice things about this app is it's completely free. Um, part, of the, part of the reason for that is it is a quote-unquote hack. It, um, I think it's a perfectly safe hack. Um, in fact, there's some kind of cool things about this app. It is sandboxed with the um, application Sandbox. So, for instance, it can't access any of your files. Um, the only thing it can do is save a screenshot to the, to a place that you select on your disk. Um, it uses the same uh, apparatus that Xcode uses, like I said, to show the touch bar simulator. Um, but it relies upon this private stuff that you know Apple doesn't really want developers using. For instance, I couldn't put this in the Mac App Store because it doesn't satisfy the guidelines for what Apple wants us to use. And there's good reasons for that. Um, it's because it's internal stuff to Apple that they don't want to have to guarantee is going to keep working this way going forward. So I see it as kind of, um, you know, hopefully it'll keep working. Um, it is kind of a hack, but it is also, you know, built as quality software in the form of a, it's a hack in the form of quality software. So how I would describe it. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting to, to, that you bring up the, the quality software thing. If this had just come out of nowhere from someone that no one had ever heard of, I, I don't think, I know you wouldn't be here because I would be very hesitant to encourage people to try it. But you have a very well-known reputation in the community. And so you are a reputable developer, no question about that. So I don't have any qualms at all about installing it on one of my machines or encouraging someone else to take a shot at it. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I really wouldn't be encouraging people to try it if I thought there was a risk in using it. It's and like I said, the sandboxing aspect of it um, is, you know, I come from a long, long time of developing for the Mac. So of course, I've been developing for the Mac since before sandbox existed. And of course, we all for decades, decades or more, you know, years or decades in some cases um, have practiced sort of the art of writing software to to be non-destructive um and you know I, I don't think you ever download anything that's completely risk-free i'll just say that that's why we have backups that's why we have you know strategies to um you know look after ourselves but um that said a combination of i think my yeah as you said i have a reputation to keep and also i have a lot of experience in not making some of the um, kinds of mistakes that might actually damage a computer, um, but also the sandbox protections that Apple gives um, really actually make it so that um, you know a whole class of things that could go wrong by running software just can't go wrong uh, as long as Apple's doing their job in the sandboxing part of things. Have you heard from Apple about this? Uh, <laughs> no, to, no, I haven't. To the good, to the good or to the bad? Um, I haven't, and uh, I'm a little. I have to admit I'm a little bit anxious about how they would feel about it. Um, I, my hope is that they would see it as something that gives excited users and developers and designers the opportunity to really check out the touch bar. Um, it has some side effects. This app has some um, really great consequences for designers, for instance, who want to um, be able to take screen captures of the touch bar as their software is being developed for um, to support it, uh, to be able to you know, quickly get up, get up and running, browsing all the different touch bar behaviors on the system. I mean, in, in case listeners aren't um, sort of getting the main point of this app is you download it, you install it, and it's not meant to be like a permanent utility, although some people might find some utility from it. It's more about getting a sneak peek into what that touch bar experience is going to be like. And it's it's not intended to be used with a mouse on a, on a window on the computer, but you start poking around on the Mac with this thing running, and you're going to see how much thought Apple has put into designing an experience around the touch bar and a whole, whole wide range of their apps. So it's kind of a cool thing to check out. I hope if Apple has an opinion about it, um, that they would see it 
kind of through the same lens you're seeing it. Like I'm a reputable developer. I'm trying to do something good here. Um, it's something that I've wondered if they, I think if they didn't like it, they might just ask me nicely <laughs> to stop distributing it. Right. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I would comply with that. But, um, to be honest, uh, you know, if they, if they, um, if they didn't like it and they wanted to say, just like take it and distribute it <laughs> themselves, that would be fine with me too. Cause I think it is a nice, even just as a developer utility, it's, I think it's a nicer way to use their simulator than what they've um, included in Xcode. So, uh, I, first of all, I've, I'm going to encourage people to go get it now, just in case. Um, <laughs> second, though, I believe I saw something on Twitter that you got fireballed um, <laughs> when, when, <laughs> when you were out running, and it came, probably, yes, came, probably came home to a slew of messages. It's kind of a nice surprise to get when you're in uh, this business like I'm in, um, when you come home to find out that your server has crashed because too many people are interested in it. <laughs> that's, um, it's one of those mixed, mixed, uh, mixed blessings. Cause you know that that's your top priority at that moment. Uh, right when, you know, thousands or maybe tens of thousands or maybe, maybe more are trying to download your stuff and they're getting a dead server. So yes, that happened. Um, it turned out, I think to be partly, a uh, mistaken configuration on my part. Uh, so it seems to be back up and running now and uh, hopefully it can withstand the Mac voices effect. That's the big question. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, Daniel, you alluded to it a minute ago, um, about how much app, how much thought Apple has put into this touch bar. The touch bar has been, obviously been super controversial. Um, so in working with it this way and cre in creating this piece of software, what is your impression of the touch bar? Because most of the audience right now do not have their touch bar equipped MacBook Pros. So, I, and, and I gather for you, it's been a very positive thing. It has been. And that's, I mean, that's one of the great reasons I think actually Apple should be excited to have people getting a glimpse of what this is because it's really easy to dismiss it if you jump to conclusions about what it is and what it does. And I've seen people online who've never touched a touch bar and never touched touche, you know, never touched anything that really gives them a good idea of how it works, dismissing it with, um, with quips like, well, I already, I already know keyboard shortcuts, so I don't need this. And if you think like the only purpose a touch bar could possibly have is to save you from, you know, knowing that command in makes a new window, then you've deeply misunderestimated, misunderestimated, you've deeply underestimated the, uh, <clears throat> or, or deeply misunderstood the, um, the uh, the potential of the touch bar. And so if that's that's the main thing. I would say if you are poo-pooing the touch bar as a concept, get to get touche, try it out, and just browse around a bunch of apps. Browse around Safari, browse around the terminal, browse around um, all of the iWork apps, uh, browse around the Finder, see the kind of clever stuff that comes up. Um, you know, there's no keyboard shortcut for I want to change the terminal color. Um, with a nice like gradient on the on the keyboard, you know, there's no keyboard shortcut for picking the perfect shade of blue. Um, and a lot of the touch bar stuff is interactive that way. It's sliders, it's um, color pickers, it's nested sort of hierarchies of data. Um, it's stuff like the um, the type completion that we're used to now from iOS, where you're typing in a in an email, let's say, and it it's not only suggests the you know spelling correction, but a suggested word. So it's just a whole slew of things that really have nothing to do with keyboard shortcuts per se. Um, and actually giving this a good look, I had such a strong impression that Apple had invested so much time in it that um, that really solidly, you know, you, you know how we all have the feeling after years and years of being Mac fans. We have the feeling sometimes that something, even if it's new from Apple, maybe doesn't have its full blessing or, you know, it's like, Oh, it yeah. just came out, and it's like, are you, yeah, is this going to be the year of Apple Script or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the um, the Touch Bar is is supported throughout such a wide array of Apple's own software. Um, my my impression is uh, that they've been working on this for a couple years, and this isn't some like last minute thing. Um, and that and that not only have they been working on it for a couple years, but that they've been refining it, you know, iteratively over those years because it doesn't look half-baked. 
in almost any way to me. And that implies to me that this is going to be a big part of the Mac going forward. Smile is sponsoring today's edition of Mac Voices. In case you don't know, Smile makes some of the best productivity software for the Mac, including PDF Pen, available in various flavors for Mac and iOS, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iOS, and Text Expander for Mac and iOS. Get all the details at smilesoftware.com. Text Expander is Smile's way to help you get more done by typing less. By creating snippets, blocks of text or code, or whatever you use frequently, you can fill them in simply by typing a few keystrokes that you assign. So, typing three lowercase d's might expand to today's date. Or type three or four keystrokes and have it expand to your full name. I have a friend whose last name is 12 characters long. By typing a simple three-character code, she can fill in her complete name easily and quickly. Text Expander might be my very favorite productivity app for a number of reasons. First, all you have to do is launch it, and it's available to all of your programs and other utilities. Second, it takes literally seconds to add a new snippet, and that snippet can be as simple as you wish. An email signature, a block of boilerplate for a contract, whatever you need. Third, you don't even have to think about what you type frequently. Text Expander watches what you type and makes suggestions about what might benefit from a snippet of its very own. Fourth, Text Expander can do so much more. Things like shortening long URLs automatically and invoking JavaScript, AppleScript, and Shell scripts, if you're into that. Add images or graphics just as easily as you do text. Fifth, Text Expander isn't just about the Mac. There's a version of Text Expander for iOS as well, and you can sync your snippets across both platforms so they're available everywhere, all the time, to keep you productive. There's even a Windows version, just in case you're trapped on a desert island with only a PC. Recently, Smile added fill-in snippets for Apple's dictation and Portuguese localization, as well as public snippet groups for the Mac version and snippet keys to the iPad and iPhone versions. And that's the sixth reason I love Text Expander. Smile is constantly expanding and improving it to make it even more valuable to you. As you can tell, I could go on and on, but we need to get back to the show. Before we do, though, I want you to visit smilesoftware.com right now and download the free trial version of Text Expander and find out how much time and effort it can save you. Then, buy straight from Smile at smilesoftware.com and take full advantage of everything that Text Expander can do for you. That's Text Expander from Smile, the makers of world class software at smilesoftware.com. Thanks to Smile for being the longest running sponsor of Mac Voices. All right, I heard, I heard everything you said, so I don't want this question to be redundant, but before Touche, before the touch bar was announced and all, were you a touchscreen Macintosh advocate or MacBook Pro advocate, or did you think that touchscreens don't belong on desktops and laptops? Oh, for the most part, I think I fall into the latter camp. I don't think they belong on desktops or laptops um, because of the whole, you know, holding your hand up. You're going to get tired in about 30 seconds. And yeah. um, I think we just have to accept that. So I really welcome challenges to that thinking by folks like Microsoft with the Surface Studio demo where, you know, the whole screen just comes down and becomes part of your, your desktop. That kind of... Um, that kind of innovation, I think. I think I would be a fool to say that with with that kind of innovation, that there's no place for touchscreen on a desktop or a laptop. Um, but I can see that for Apple, this could be an incremental step towards touchscreens. Uh, but I think it also, I think that you know, those of us who are still big Mac fans, we can love our iOS devices. But those of us who are big Mac fans really appreciate the the sort of like stability and the utility of full keyboard, kind of an established place to work. Um, and I think that this is an example of the kind of like, you know, quote unquote power user type. It's, it's funny that the touch bar is kind of a power user thing and it's kind of a, a naive user thing. Um, it goes both ways. I think, you know, it's an emoji picker and it's like, you know, something, like I said, you can set the color of your, um, your terminal, uh, with it, but I think um, I think it's just a completely completely different kind of thinking than the touch screen on the display, um, and we'll see if Apple ever does that. But um, 
you know, you got to kind of admit as cool as something like the Surface Studio is, having to completely rejigger your workspace, you know, from one mode to another is, is something. And there's something to be said for this thing just works the way that it is. No matter where you are, you pop open the lid and your touch bar is there and it works and you don't have to do some kind of acrobatic dance to get it to a state that it does what you expect it to. Yeah, I, I looked at the Surface Studio and and naturally I'm going to be critical of it, but there, there are a number of things I, I just, I'm not so sure about, but that's not how I use my Mac. And yeah. so, you know, it, it may not, it just simply may not apply to me. I don't know. It, it it's a concept that we'll have to wait and see. I do know one thing that has has me concerned for the Surface Studio investors, and that is the people I mean that invest in buying one is right. that you've got moving parts, and yes. moving parts, you know, it's, that's one of the beauties of getting away from some of this stuff. And yeah. you know, all of a sudden now I've got something that's spring loaded uh, in some fashion. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, it looks it looks impressive, but uh, oh, yeah. I think I think we can appreciate what they're doing, and and I think that as soon as the Touch Bar was announced, my thinking at least was oriented away from comparing to to Microsoft. I think a lot of people thought, well, what's Apple going to come up with to to counter this? And it's not really a counter to Microsoft; it's a completely different direction, and it is a direction to Apple's credit that I don't see any comparison to from any other computer maker. So there's something there. Well, I, I felt like it was an interesting. I, I've, I'm trying not to use the word compromise, but so I'm going to say a melding of the idea that there are there are indeed we've learned some things we've learned from iOS. There's some things that this is better for maybe yeah. than a mouse, but there are a whole lot of things that a mouse is better at, a, a lot more precise things that it's better at. So it's an interesting way to meld the two without doing the, as Ted Landau would say, the iOSification of, mm. of Mac OS. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to get mine and try it and just find out what a difference it makes in my workflows. But yeah, very different approach, but yeah. fascinating, fascinating. Um, you know, you, you said just, you know, kind of wander around, do Safari, do different things. So does this touch bar actually, I mean, I, I it's it's strange trying to talk about a touch device, a virtual touch device yeah. that you can't touch. But can you do everything pretty much with it that you can do with the touch bar? Um, pretty much. There are some examples I ran into where um, where the act of trying to interact with the touch bar on the screen um, changes the touch bar. So, for example... Um, well, that's a good example, actually. Um, well, for example, if you, um, if you go to take a screenshot with these, using the, uh, the max built in screenshot facility, command shift four, command shift three, um, one of the clever things the touch bar does is it goes into a mode that lets you set options for that screenshot. So you can change it from say, taking a screenshot of the window to, um, you know, taking a screenshot of a selection on the screen, kind of all the same things that there are currently keyboard shortcuts to do with screen captures. Um, but because you're in the screen capture mode now, if you go to then tap on a pertinent area of the screen of the touch bar in Touche, it doesn't do what you expect it to because it's in the middle of capturing um, wow. from the screen instead. So there's a few little edge cases there where the um where you know what the touch bar is exposing to you is so intricately tied to there being a separation between the touch bar and the actual screen that the fact that this um simulator forces them to be all one and the same reveals problems sometimes yeah, and that makes sense because this is a simulator it's not an actual touch bar so yes right okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think you've done a great service to a lot of us who are, are having to sit here patiently, maybe not so patiently, yeah. <laughs> waiting for our new MacBook Pros. Um, so we get a feel for this, and I, I think we're going to be ready to go with it a little more out of the gate than we would have been without it. So congratulations and thank oh, you. Thanks. Thank I, you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But this is a free utility, but you, you have other things that you do to actually pay the bills, which are pretty mm -hmm. important. Yes. Um, and, and I want to mention one of the ones that I use probably just about every day, if not, if not every, at least every other day. Um, and that is Mars Edit. 
Um, oh, right. Yes. It, it's just, it's a fantastic piece of software. I love it um, because it let me lets me compose uh, posts to my websites offline and then upload them in a very logical fashion. And it's one of those, Daniel, I just never have any trouble with. So mm. <laughs> thank you for that, too. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Well, that's the... Um you know, that's the professional software aspect at work again. And um, I've been working now on Mars Edit for, believe it or not, coming up on 10 years. It will be 10 wow. years in February, I think, uh, maybe March. And that was uh, 10 years since I acquired the app from uh, the company that uh, Brent Simmons was working for, who had who had acquired it from him. Um so this is an old app, and you know sometimes it shows its age, but um, it's getting to be one of those apps where um, yes, it's a, it's a little bit old. I do keep it up as well as I can, but as you said, you know not running into problems. That's kind of a nice side effect of working on something for ten plus years, and um, you know the app itself rather is probably closer to fifteen years old now. So um, yeah, thank you. That's uh, one of the things that I. I take seriously is reliability of the software. So, um, to me, I guess if I was to say, is there a frustration among my customers? Sometimes it's, um, people who would rather maybe have it be less reliable and more, <laughs> more updated. <laughs> but, um, I, I, you know, I'm happy with the, um, falling on the more reliable side of things when I can. Well, I mean, we all would say, Daniel, could you sneak this, yeah, this feature right. in? And that feature, <laughs> you know, because we all have our own little idiosyncratic ways of using it. But at the end of the day, I've got so much muscle and memory invested now that I really don't want you to change too much stuff because <laughs> I know how to do everything. So, you know, just, just yeah. please keep it stable and going because it, it, I think it's one of the great treasures of the Mac software world um, that Thank it you. is so stable and, and so useful. Um, but what what else does uh, Re does Red Sweater publish at this point? Well, it's kind of a mis uh, not a mismatch, a hodgepodge, I should say, should say. Um, I have uh, definitely Mars Edit is the big one. Uh, that's my my main business and my livelihood. As you said, this one is this you know touche is free. Uh, I'm putting it out there for free partly because of the um, sort of private stuff that it uses from Apple, and I don't know if it's going to get you know, supported for the long term, so I don't feel comfortable charging. Um, you know, that said, I put a link in the about box to a donations link. So if people like it and they want to support that that kind of thing existing in the world, they have a way of doing that. Um, but Mars Edit has really been my my um, main livelihood for you know the past ten years. Um, and uh, but I also have um, probably my second most um, popular app is Black Ink. And um, it's a crossword solving app. So you uh, it's another Mac app. You download it on your Mac. And uh, this one costs $10. Um, you download it to your Mac. And its sole purpose in life is to work with standard crossword documents. Um, that is, open them up, let you solve them with a nice, um, you know, typing in the answers, looking at the clues. You can... Uh, you can use it if you're like an avid uh, New York Times solver or something. You have a New York Times subscription. You can use Black Ink to um, to download your your New York Times puzzles and solve them. I think in the best possible uh, environment, which is on the Mac in a you know well designed, reliable app. So that's probably my my other main app at this point. Okay, great, folks. You know. Take a good look at your screen because this is what an independent software developer looks like. And, and listen to him carefully. This is how a, an independent software developer thinks. Mm -hmm. And I've, I wish we had more of them out there that could write software that is, just, is as successful as yours is, that allows you to do it. Um, because I think you offer so much to the community. And we, we all really appreciate it. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much. It means a lot. So we send people to redsweater.com. Yeah, and the caveat, uh, unfortunately, even though I registered my domain name in 1999, I still managed to miss the one without the dash in it. So it's red-sweater.com. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah, just to just just to uh, get people in the right direction. There's a you know 
There's a nice woman at redsweater.com with no dash who will have no idea what to do with your questions about Touche. <laughs> I can, I can only, only imagine. There's a Ken Bone joke in here somewhere, but I'm not I going know. there. No, it's not good into that. <laughs> no, no. Um, so that's where we go to get everything, including Touche. But you do one or two other things as well in the developer community, and I want to make sure we plug those oh, yeah. so people know where to find them. Sure. Well, the uh, the other main thing I do, and it's actually become a part of my livelihood as well because of ads on it, is uh, I have a podcast as well, and it's called Core Intuition. Uh, it's at core, C-O-R-E, int, I-N-T, dot org. And that is now coming up on, it's over eight years old, if you can believe that as well. Um, and it's me and my um, co, you know, my indie developer cohort, uh, Manton Reese, Riverfold software, he and I have just been talking about, it's kind of a good show, you know, uh, consider checking it out even if you're not a developer, because a lot of our listeners actually are um, listening because they're just interested in, like you said, the mind of the developers, right? What are we, what are we thinking? How are Apple's decisions affecting us? Um, how do we prioritize things like which features we pursue? Um, what's, you know, how important is customer support? All these different questions that if you're an indie developer, especially if you're a one-person indie development team, you actually have to answer every single question yourself. Um, and so we just kind of meet up every week and talk about whatever crosses our mind. And uh, that's that's uh, probably my main pursuit. And then with him, we also have, a, um, funnily enough, we also have a job board. So we're kind of just like building an empire over there. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's good. Yeah. Next time you come back, we'll bring your crown, please. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, folks can follow you on Twitter as well, I believe. That's right. On Twitter, I am Daniel Punk Ass. It's my very quaint, very family friendly name. <laughs> and um, I've had it for years and I'm sticking with it. But uh, yeah, you can find me over there. Um, you can also follow Red Sweater with no dash on Twitter. I got that one earlier and <laughs> early enough. And. Uh, you know, just drop me a line if you uh, have any thoughts about my software or you just want to check in. I'm happy to hear from potential and actual customers at any time. Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I know it's, I, I, we said before the show, every time I pop up one of my news feeds, uh, you're getting an amazing amount of press out of Touche. And, and I'm so happy for it because it just calls more attention to you and to Red Sweater and hopefully makes people aware of your other apps. So. Yeah, I hope so. That's one of the, that is one of the goals, as well as giving everybody something to try and helping out with you know, that. It's, it's, I'm not going to complain if it gets people talking about Red Sweater. So if you uh, just take a look at my software and if you like Touche, take a look at the other software. And if it's not for you, maybe pass the word along to somebody that you think might like it. And as I said before, I can tell you, folks, if you have the need for something to let you compose offline and then post to your website, this is the one you want to start with because you won't need to go any farther. Thanks so much. Daniel, thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. That sounds great. Thanks again for having me. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Go check out Touche. Check out uh, Marzetta. Check out everything at Red Sweater. You won't be un unhappy with doing so. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes, links to subscribe, and to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, the Mac Voices blog, the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and on Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard that helps you do more with your Apple tech. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at BackbeatMedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com.